Stefanos, your investigation shows that Michelin and Barito Pacific's reforestation project with uh, rubber trees was non-compliant with green finance criteria. How has it been possible for Michelin and its Indonesian partner to sidestep completely the rules of green bonds? Well, the, the easiest answer is that actually uh, there are no <clears throat> rules on green bonds in the sense that there is no public legislation, public uh, uh, legislation which has been put in place by either national countries or by the European Union to uh, regulate uh, green finance. What exists is an international framework of uh, voluntary standards, which have been uh, put in place by uh, the market itself. And uh, those uh, green finance standards can be used by, uh, <clears throat> by uh, green bonds issuers to um, claim that uh, their bonds are green, but uh, actually there is no public authority which is uh, which has the power to enforce those standards since they are voluntary. Um, what happens is that um, in order for uh, bond issuers, in this case, the bond issuer was not directly Michelin, but uh, it was a platform which was co-founded by the United Nations Environmental Programme and uh, the French bank, BP Paribas. So this platform uh, issued uh, the green bonds on behalf of uh, Michelin and its uh, Indonesian partner, Barito Pacific. So uh, what happened is that in order for, for a bond issuer to have uh, its bonds uh, certif be certified as green, the only thing they need to do is uh, um, pay um, what is called a qualified certifier or assessor, which does the paperwork and uh, at the end of the, this paperwork process, uh, decides that uh, the bonds are, are to be considered as uh, compliant with international voluntary standards. Uh, this certification process doesn't look like very serious because as I said, it's based just on paperwork, meaning uh, the certifier just uh, made, makes the assessment based on information which is provided by the bond issuer itself. In this case, the, the bond issuer was uh, the platform and the certifying company uh, interviewed uh, BP Paribas and um, Michelin partner. Uh, the certifying uh, agency doesn't make any uh, field investigation. So I didn't send anyone to uh, Indonesia, to the area where the project uh, was located. And uh, on top of that, it didn't do any uh, controversial screening for uh, the subsidiary of Barito Pacific, which um, was in charge of the concession and which actually uh, was responsible for uh, the clear uh, clearing of the forest. So um, the, uh, in this case, the certifying agency uh, is uh, the French-based company Vigel, which was uh, taken over by the uh, famous um, rating agency Moody's, the US company, in 2018. Um, Vigel was paid by uh, the bond issuer, so uh, there is no way that the company which is paid by its own customer can, uh, can be independent. But this is how the system works. And um, uh, Vigel uh, certified the bonds uh, according to uh, the green bonds principles which are a standard set by the, the organization which represents the capital market players and it's called the International Market Capital Market Association. And those principles actually say that uh, uh, green bonds can only, can, only, can only be used to support projects which uh, uh, set um, goals uh, in terms of uh, uh, sustainable management of uh, natural resources, such as uh, uh, forests. So um, the fact that um, the bonds which have, have been used by Michelin, its partner Barito Pacific, to uh, pay back uh, part of the cost of the forest clearing, which uh, occurred before Barito Pacific and Michelin signed their partnership, doesn't really look like a stable management of, uh, of natural resources. 
which uh, means that uh, the forest should be preserved, not be clean. So this project uh, is uh, by definition not uh, compliant with uh, the green bond principles set by the International Capital Market Association. Another principle which has been uh, violated by this project is the principle of transparency. Uh, the, green bonds, the green bonds principles require a bond issuer to provide accurate and, uh, and, uh, and um, uh, transfer information to the investors. So in this case, Michelin, Eberito Pacific, and BNP Paribas, which uh, played the role of a green bonds distributor, should have uh, informed precisely and we know uh, doubt the investors that uh, parts of the forest, uh, which was clear in the concession where the project is located, was actually uh, cleared by Barito Pacific, so Michelin Partners. And uh, they did quite the opposite. The, uh, pub, the, the project information document, which was circulated by BP Paribas among the prospective investors, meaning the investors who are uh, potentially um, uh, assessing the idea of uh, put their money into this project, only says that uh, the, um, the concession where the Michelin and Barito Pacific were planning to, uh, to plant rubber trees. So this area was uh, deforested by unknown, unknown uh, authors, such as uh, encroachers, illegal loggers, and uh, farmers. They didn't mention at all that actually a large part of this area was for deforested by Barito Pacific subsidiary itself. And, uh, so uh, the investors uh, naively believed that uh, Michelin Barito Pacific were going to, uh, to preserve the forest which was remaining after uh, the clearance by unknown, uh, unknown authors, while actually their money was precisely used to uh, to recover part of the cost of uh, the forest clearance, which was made by Michelin Partner. Um, this is the, they are the two main uh, breaches. And the reason why this uh, violation occurred is, is because the, the system is voluntary. So there is no public uh, enforcement. And also because, as I said, the certific certification process is, on, is only based on paperwork and on, not on uh, uh, on-site investigation. And, um, and also because the, uh, the review agency doesn't have any obligation to revise its uh, certification report, even when it knows that uh, the bond issuers lied during the assessment process. We had an interview with David Geo, and we asked him, so now that you know that uh, Michelin Park, the Barito Pacific cleared the forest in the first place, why don't you change, why don't you revise your uh, certification report? Why don't you inform investors that actually they put their money in a project which didn't comply with the Green Board principles? And they said, we don't need to do anything. And indeed, the Green Board principles, they require the assessor, in this uh, case, uh, Vigeo, to revise the certification uh, report only if the Green, green Bond issuer uh, requests for it. So basically, Vigeo should ask, actually ask uh, Michelin, uh, if Michelin wants them to revise the report, but of course Michelin doesn't have any interest in having a report saying, hey, hello the investors, actually we just found out that uh, Michelin partner uh, cleared the forest in the first place, so the bonds were not really green. Of course, I that's, uh, that's uh, quite a, an absurd and pervert uh, system. And uh, Stefano, just uh, speaking of uh, transparency, uh, can you remind us who is among the co founders and shareholders of uh, Vigeo Iris, so the, uh, the, the company that yeah. certified the green bonds? So this is one of the twists in our investigation. Uh, the more we, we dug uh, in depth, the more uh, interesting things we found out. So um, one of the shareholders of uh, Vigeo, so the company which assessed the project uh, sponsored by green bonds distributed by the bank BP Paribas. So one of the shareholders was BP Paribas itself. And, and as I said, Vigeo, within the assessment leading to the certification of green bonds, interviewed BP Paribas. So basically, Vigeo was interviewing one of its owners. 
that is it's clear a case of conflict of interest. And also Moody's, which took over with Jack in 2018, was uh, also mandated by um, the Green Bond issuer. This is a platform where uh, BP Paribas played the role of a bonds distributor to rate, to rate the green bonds itself. And uh, Moody's gave the highest rating to, uh, to um, the notes, which is a triple A. And this triple A actually was um, very important to draw the interest of uh, wealthy uh, investors, which are always looking for highly, highly rated green bonds. So Moody's, uh, on the one hand, rated uh, the green bonds. And on the other hand, through its subsidiary, BGEO, that took over in 2018, also certify the bonds as green. That doesn't doesn't actually work. That's why we had such a, a, a crazy situation with this uh, rubber plants and deforestation beforehand. So what do you think is the responsibility of the uh, actual process of that certification? And what is the state of the art of the European legislation on green bonds? Thanks a lot and, and thank for the invitation. I'm glad to be here tonight. Um, just going back on the certification process, as Stefano said, virtually all green and sustainable or sustainability link bonds use the International Capital Market Association green bond principle as evidence of their environmental credentials. And this is the case for the one we are discussing here in Vigero Iris did deliver the second party opinion, um, allowing this green bond to be certified as aligned with the uh, ICMA standards. Uh, so the responsibility lies partly uh, at the level of the certification pro uh, process uh, companies, the ICMA, and also at the level of uh, the second party uh, opinion. And as Stefano said, uh, these guidelines do not constitute an in-depth assessment of the environmental and climate credentials of bonds as their purpose is to define just a framework for market practices in terms of disclosure and financial structuring. Uh, so in terms of reporting of the departments that needs to be involved in the issuance process, uh, what's the broad, they have a broad definition of what greens uh, is and as defined by the issuer, et cetera. And, and similarly, the second party opinion, which most green bonds use to back the quality of the bond is often limited to verifying the alignment of the issuer's bond document with the ICMA principle. So if the principle are bad at the first place, the SPO uh, is, um, is very likely to be, uh, to be as bad. So uh, none of them should uh, therefore uh, be taken as evidence of environmental or climate cred credibility um, and some today second party opinions may assess environmental aspect but their assessment are often limited to very broad ESG ratings and involvement into controversial activities uh, peer comparisons of industry benchmark uh, so it's a very limited assessment in in other words um, does the EU legislation change anything to that? Uh, unfortunately, not really, because the EU green bond standards are a voluntary framework and banks and investors are free to follow them or not. Uh, moreover, while the standards are better than many others uh, and could have sent a signal to many of the standards about what is best practice, uh, the definition of what is green sticks to the EU taxonomy, which in itself raises many issues uh, because of the integration of gas or nuclear or many other things uh, in it. So the question of responsibility is a is a is a great one. Um, obviously, uh, certification, second party opinion, um, as I said, do not give any guarantee to investors that a green bond is really financing green activities. However, I would you say that the responsibility also lies in the hands of the banks that help a company to issue a greenwash bond, or also in the hands of the investors themselves that do uh, decide to invest in this bond. 
like the Michelin, the Michelin case is only one of the many cases that we have that show that Greenbaum's uh, certification processes cannot be trusted. And so the responsibility at the end lies in the hands of the investors that decide to uh, invest in, in, in green bonds uh, without doing by themselves uh, the verification that are, uh, that are needed. Stefano, uh, so you, as I said, you're in, an investigative journalist, so you, you're, that's your job to dig in and, 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 and find the good subjects. So how did you get the idea to work on this uh, investigation on Michelin? And did you have any hints from maybe other similar scandals? Yeah, the, um, I had an idea actually from uh, one of the attend at, um, attendees of uh, this conference, Alex from uh, Matyev, which, which is the NGO which uh, exposed this uh, scam, uh, the first in, uh, in 2020 with a report. And, um, so I got in touch with Alex and uh, he sent me his report. Uh, it was full of uh, satellite images, which had been uh, crafted uh, uh, by uh, Leo Botril, who is the CEO of MapHubs, a geospatial uh, company. And uh, through these images, uh, my chef proved that um, a large share of the forest, which was in the concession uh, on, uh, sorry, the concession which was operated by the subsidiary of Barito Pacific in uh, Jambi province in Sumatra Island was actually cleared by, um, by the company itself. Although the largest part was uh, cleared by uh, encroachers, but uh, at least we calculated that uh, one third of, um, of the area where the rubber was planted was actually cleared by the company itself. And um, I decided to uh, to um, take uh, the work that uh, Mighty Earth had done uh, further. And the idea was actually uh, to gather evidence on uh, different uh, aspects, which, um, which to me seemed very important. The first and the utmost, which, was, which is the key revelation of our investigation, is that the green bonds, the money that investors put in the, in the project, uh, didn't only uh, financially support the plantation of rubber after that Pareto Pacific and Michelin signed their partnership, but that one part, a large part of uh, this money uh, contributed to support financially also the forest clearing and the tree planting, which happened before Michelin uh, uh, joined the game with the Pareto Pacific. So uh, that means that uh, really part of the money was really used to greenwash the deforestation. And um, the other thing they wanted to find out is um, uh, whether the, um, the forest, which was uh, cleared through uh, the partial support of the green bonds, was uh, an important uh, biodiversity hotspot, not just a bushland or, uh, or a grassland. It was actually a real forest with the um, animal species, which are using it as an important habitat. And uh, we found out that um, a, um, a large part of uh, the area which was uh, deforested was uh, a key vital habitat for uh, endangered, spe endangered species, actually critical endangered species, meaning that uh, they are close to extinction, uh, particularly the um, elephants, the orangutan and tigers. And, um, Barito Pacific and Mich knew that uh, this uh, area was a, a, a fundamental habitat for these uh, animal species. And despite that, decided to, uh, to go ahead and uh, clear the forest anyway. And uh, we also wanted uh, to know whether clearing forest before committing to deforestation, no deforestation policy, which is exactly what Barito Pacific and Michelin did after uh, signing their joint venture, so if clearing the forest and then uh, adopting a no, no deforestation policy, that is something which is acceptable according to, to the voluntary standards on green finance. So with the interviews with um, uh, the International Capital Market Association expert, and also with experts of another organization, which I'm going to mention later on. And all of those, those experts actually 
were quite surprised by my question. So I asked them, is it possible that the company clear the forest and then after a few months decided, decided to turn green through a no deforestation commitment? And just precisely because it adopts this no deforestation policy, then it is entitled to issue green bonds to fund uh, its new sustainable project. And they said, done, this is not really acceptable. Uh, we cannot accept projects which uh, first clear the forest and then they, they decided to go green through a no deforestation policy. Those projects are not compliant with our uh, green bond principles. It was the answer of uh, the ICMA. Lucy, uh, the term green finance was formalized by the Paris Climate Agreement in 2015 and encompasses actually an array of tools, instruments and actors. And what, what changes in the legislation do you, do you identify as urgent and necessary? And that I can ask a question that Paul also asked you in the chat. Um, is there any hope? It seems that corporate interests will always find a way, ways to get away with weak regulations and greenwashing. Can, what can be done? That's a very good question. Um, but regarding green bonds, um, there are several things that could be done at the at the regulation level first to make sure that banks, investors, and issuers report uh, with details and very carefully the assets that are being finance for a green bond. As a documentation, uh, we are not always easy to understand or precise or accessible. Um, so that's the first thing. First, uh, make information available. Um, the second thing is to make sure that the green uh, means green. Uh, so the Michelin case is only one of the many obvious cases of greenwashing around a uh, green bond. We also um, have evidences of green bonds that are being issued today to finance LNG terminals, um, especially in Asia by Capco. Um, we also find out in January um, randomly, so it's only one of the of the many things that we will we will uh, got. Um, we we found out about a green bond that was uh, supported again by being Paribas. Uh, for the extension of an airport uh, at Hong Kong um, with a huge impact on climate, but also on biodiversity, considering the extension the project was over overseas where the latest uh, Asian dolphins um, are today. Um, so making a strong definition of green and making sure that it's a dark green and not even a, a shy green, but uh, or, 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 or very polluting projects is, is key. Uh, and the last thing I would say is to make sure that the issuers um, that issue green bonds um, can do so only if uh, the issuance of a green bond is part of broader, sincere uh, climate strategy. Uh, as I said earlier, some uh, big polluters will uh, issue green bonds because it uh, um, gives them uh, an easy access to, 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 to fresh capital, um, but uh, it's, uh, it's, part of, it's not part of a diversification or decarbonization strategy, just... Uh, uh, it's just a way for them to, to raise uh, capital and we need to make sure that only companies that do have a credible transition plan um, should be allowed to issue such um, such uh, financial uh, products. And, 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 and as I said, beyond uh, green bond is only one example among the many uh, so-called sustainable products that are being uh, um, marketed uh, with uh, fake allegation uh, on environmental and social practices. Uh, I mentioned the issue with SFDR earlier, um, which is again just a, a very new illustration of an, a very old issue. Um, in France right now, uh, one of the main uh, so-called sustainable products, which is called social, socially responsible investment funds, uh, do still allow fossil fuel companies or weapons company or companies that are associated with human rights violation to also be uh, integrated into funds that are being labelized by the French state as socially responsible investment. Um, however, there might be uh, hope on the way, as I said, uh, 
Um, today, some uh, market authorities at national level show sign of being uh, willing to control more the uh, marketing, uh, which is done by uh, financial uh, institutions. Um, and, and there are a lot of uh, statements that are being made by the IS authority to define also more broadly what sustainability means. Um, we have uh, several pieces of regulation, so I can just maybe mention one or two. Um, one a very recent example, um, unfortunately indeed, it's a, it's, a, it's a good news and a bad news. Um, the good news is that there is a discussion at the EU level about um, due diligence uh, through a piece of law which is called CSDDD, uh, which is about uh, making sure that uh, companies um, do uh, anticipate and mitigate their impact on society, on their environment, on the population, and 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 control and 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 and, and avoid uh, having a negative impact on 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 them. And um, this regulation, uh, the fact that it's being discussed is already a good sign. Um, unfortunately, last week, because of uh, the lobbying done by um, France uh, and Germany, uh, the piece of law was being diluted and uh, with several uh, implications. Uh, one uh, for all companies, which is a definition of what kind of activities uh, needs to be covered by this uh, regulation. And another one, maybe more relevant for this uh, call, is the fact that financial institutions um, might not be uh, covered uh, by the regulation. It will depend, uh, it could depend ultimately of uh, the decision of each uh, member states. Um, but it's uh, already uh, pretty sure that uh, investors, not banks or not insurers, but investors will not be will not be will not be covered. So um, obviously it's not as if everything was gonna be solved uh, overnight. Uh, first of all, this piece of law uh, takes a lot of time. But uh, there is progress, at least in the fact that it's being uh, discussed and it's uh, not the time to give up. It's actually the time to maintain the pressure on uh, the financial institutions and on the market authorities and on the political decision makers uh, to make sure that um, they uh, strengthen the, the, the practices and the regulation, the regulatory framework uh, that is being uh, discussed.